start. Got it. All right, we'll give uh, a little bit of time. Hello. Oh, I see people coming in. Welcome. Yes. Welcome. So much looking. Oh, looking forward to this. A lot of cryptid fans. Hello. <laughs> hey. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yay. Hey, everybody. Oh, wow. very cool. Um, we're very excited about this. Hmm. Ooh, see, you see, now there's now there's a lot of pressure because you said that, now that you said that this is your first event. Now, yeah. now everybody's here, so the um, the pressure is on. Good, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. No, I'm not ready for it, but I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, very, very cool. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to give a quick welcome and um, we'll do some housekeeping rules. I actually should probably change my name on the screen so people know who I am. Um, let me see, rename. Hello, lots of cool people here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I meant to send that to everybody, I don't know. That's that. okay, I have that problem too. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay. Welcome everybody. This is Jessica. Um, I am really happy to see everybody who has come out this evening for uh, this is technically our final summer scares event. Mm. Um, and this is really cool because this is one of those books as soon as I saw it I was like cryptids I love cryptids let's do this one. Um, so um, regardless of how you found us be it through the library or um, our partners at NaNoWriMo and you or you just want to know more about cryptids and you you want to know more about the book uh, welcome um, so once again my name is Jessica I'm one of the um, librarians at Sayasset Library uh, my co-host today is Jen hi I'm a library aide in media at the library and uh, we are very excited to be presenting um, J.W. Ocker for this event. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping um, rules. This is a fun, friendly event. Um, and uh, we, do at, we do encourage audience participation. However, we ask that it's kept friendly and appropriate. So any semblance of um, racism, hate speech or abusive language will have you removed from the meeting, uh, which is definitely not why we're here. Um, I know I am here because I cannot wait to hear about um, the United States of cryptids. Um, and, uh, and I do wanna ask you about your cursed objects book as well, but we can get to that later. <laughs> um, so that said, uh, we do, as I mentioned, encourage audience participation, but you might have noticed that this event is in um, webinar mode. So uh, there are two ways that we do ask you to engage. Um, one would be through the chat function. The other is through the Q and A function. Um, if you have a question or a comment, uh, drop, drop it in the Q and A and the chat and Jen, or myself, we'll see that uh, the question is addressed. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop talking. And I'm going to turn, oh wait, one more thing, one more thing. This is being co-streamed on our Facebook Live um, and the video will also be later on um, YouTube. So uh, if you want to watch this again, or if you want to tell your friend that you saw it live and rub it in their face that you got to ask a question and then show them the video, uh, you could tell them that you can either find it at Syasset Library's YouTube or at the, um, Facebook page for trending at Sayasset Library. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh, we already have a question. Oh, okay, what's your favorite cryptid? Uh, so um, I don't know if you wanna answer that first or if you wanna do a little preamble before we jump right into it. What do you think? Well, yeah, tell you what, I have a presentation I'll give you guys. And honestly, I'll tell you right away, that answer is in the presentation. So you'll, you'll get a really good answer to that one. Um, but if we, if we could throw your questions in there, I'll answer them all at the end. Hopefully I'll cover some of them for the presentation. Um, but hopefully also i don't cover them all so uh, you know i will definitely answer that question in this presentation so it'll be it'll be fun okay all right. it's all you go for it all right let me share my screen then uh, and you're gonna have to tell me if you see um me a book and a title you see all that perfect awesome so i am really excited to talk to you guys about cryptids i was telling the team earlier that this is the first time I've ever given this talk. I've not given a talk about cryptos before. Um, so I'm excited to kind of to, to run this by you guys. 
And it also means I might flub some things, <laughs> flub some things. So please, please allow me a few mistakes uh, as I kind of dry run this. But the reason why it's my first talk about cryptids is because the book itself, and this is another reason why I'm, I'm excited to, brief, to bring this to you guys tonight, isn't quite out. It comes out in one month, September 27th. So you guys are getting a very, very special preview of what's in this book, um, which means also that you guys can pre-order it if you, if you so want to. It's, it's out there for pre-order September 27th, just a month away. Um, and so the third reason why I'm excited to bring this to you is because I've been working in this world of cryptids for now a year and a half, traveling, researching, writing, and not able to talk to anybody about it yet because it all goes in the book and I'm alone in a room writing about it. So I'm really excited to finally bring this to somebody and then hear your questions about it as well. And what I've done is I've arranged this presentation in nine different things that I learned as I kind of walked, whatever, not walked, but I drove through the United States of cryptids to find out about this unique, unique, unique thing called cryptids. And that's where I'll start. I'll start with the term cryptids because I learned in my, in my travels that it's not that commonly known a word, uh, the word itself. In fact, what I learned was it's a very messy term just in general. So the literal definition of cryptid is an animal that is claimed to exist, but not proven to exist. <laughs> that's a really confusing thing. But basically what it means is there is certain types of evidence that these animals exist. And what I have pictured here is the Jersey Devil. The, the artist is uh, Derek Quinlan, who did all the illustrations in my book. And I promise you the book is worth picking up just for those. Like skip the words, just look at all the nice illustrations in there. Um, but basically what that means is there's evidence of these, of these creatures existing, either firsthand evidence, eyewitness, or photography even, video, very blurry video, but, but video as well, but there's no body. So really just like when a, crime, when a murder has been committed, you need a body to, to uh, kind of convict the crime. For a creature to be acknowledged in the scientific canon, in zo the zoological canon, we need remains. It can be the whole body, it can be the hoof of the Jersey devil, whatever it is, we need a body in order to substantiate it. And these are cryptid, these are animals that we just don't have the remains yet, or maybe never, or maybe they don't exist, who knows but they don't have a body at the end of the day. And cryptozoology is a study of these creatures. Now the study without a body means they're studying traces, footprints, evidence, um, secondary evidence. They're, they're interviewing witnesses. They're looking into mythologies, history, stories. So there's still a lot to study even without bodies. Um, but that is really what technically a cryptid is and cryptozoology is. However, even the people I talked to who didn't know what a cryptid was, when I asked the very next question, they knew exactly what I was talking about when I said, well, have you heard of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster? Boom. Of course, <laughs> we've all heard of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. They're like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. They're very, very famous entities in the world. And these are cryptids. Um, I, I put these in the category of plausible biological animals, right? Hairy hominids exist. We're in a room full, a, a virtual room full of hairy hominids right now. We're, we're all mam mammals with hair. So a Bigfoot is pretty plausible as an idea. Lake monsters, water monsters, the earth is 75% covered with water. We do not know what's all in those depths. So that's also a plausible creature. And traditionally, historically, cryptozoology has covered animals like these, creatures like these that seem to be very plausible that they could exist. There's not, nothing like really um, uh, negating the concept right away. However, <laughs> over the years, over the decades, pop culture has come in and said, that's not enough. We want way more things than just hairy apes and uh, serpentine uh, lake dwellers. We want more than that. So the definition of cryptid is really, in pop culture at least, has really widened to encompass all kinds of things. For instance, this is the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a Native American story from the snowy climbs of North America, upper United States and Canada. Um, it's, it's a spirit, it's a myth, it's a cautionary tale, it's a morality fable, it's a lot of things, they're very complex things uh, in Native American culture. And of course, when you pull a concept from one culture into another, we end up dumbing it down a lot. And so we, what we did to, the, to this concept is we just kind of pulled it across and said, oh, it's a monster. Um, the, whole, the whole idea of a Wendigo comes out of the idea that, you know, when you live in those snowy climes, if you don't, if your stocks run out in the middle of those harsh winters up north, you know, the temptation to cannibalism is strong. And they, they call it kind of being possessed by the Wendigo or going Wendigo. And there's, there's stories of people doing that where they were just hungry in the middle of winter time, no way to get food, and they turned on other human beings and became literal monsters, cannibals. And that's kind of where the Wendigo started. Um, but since then, again, we pulled it into kind of myth. It started as a myth. We pulled it into more into like the cryptid world uh, because myths kind of go in the cryptid world for various reasons. I'll tell you a big reason here in a second, but some people just say it could be based on a real creature or it could have been based on a historic creature, who knows. Um, but, that, but, the word, but the word cryptid has gone beyond extremely, biolog extremely plausible biological creatures 
to encompass myths. It's also encompassed things like this. This is the elephant man of Pascaluga, Mississippi. It is an alien. Um, it, it and its colleagues <laughs> came down in the ship and abducted two fishermen in the 1950s in Pascaluga, Mississippi. Um, so, and it gets its name from the wrinkled skin. But again, aliens are technical crypt, crypt, technically cryptids, right? Because they're creatures that haven't been officially recognized by science. Like the idea of alien life beyond the planet is of course extremely plausible, like, likely depending on what theories you subscribe to. But the idea of them visiting our little corner of the universe, our little planet is a little bit more contentious. So, you know, they, they kind of fit into the idea of cryptids. There's no body. We have no, Roswell aside, you know, we have no remains of an alien. So they kind of fall into that same, same world. And in fact, I always think in my head that, you know, ufologists and cryptozoologists have a lot in common. They kind of drink at the same bars. They kind of <laughs> cry into the same beers, have the same challenges. Uh, the other parties that also hang out at that bar are paranormal. So people that believe in ghosts, people that believe in cryptids, people that believe in that UFOs have visited us. They all kind of have the same challenges and, and excitements and interesting creatures. Um, the other interesting thing about the Pascaluga uh, Elephant Man is it's not just an alien, it's a robot. So we have alien, an alien robot as a cryptid. Um, the, even though the skin is wrinkled, it's very hard. They floated, um, they acted mechanically. And then according to the witnesses, the abductees, the two men that were abducted, when they got pulled into the ship, there were actual biological entities in there. So these were like the robotic henchmen for, for the actual, you know, uh, aliens. So we can have robot cryptids <laughs> in cryptozoology. And in fact, not just one, there is another robot cryptid in cryptozoology that I'm gonna hit on later in the, in the talk. And then finally, besides myths, besides aliens, alien robots, we also have stuff like this, um, creatures of uh, fable. This is a puck wudgie, mostly known in Massachusetts, also somewhat in the Midwest. But these are you know, sentient creatures. They have, you know, they make weapons and they're ashamed of the genitalia like all de decent people are. They just are, you know, elves, trolls, gnomes, or they're kind of fantasy creatures, but there are stories around them. So, you know, people who are fans of cryptids want them in the family as well. Cryptozoology is very inclusive, very welcoming to all kinds of creatures. So in the end, what I kind of really believe about this phenomenon of, um, you know, adding in a wide variety of creatures, creatures beyond the biologically plausible creatures like Bigfoot and lake monsters is that in the end, Cryptids are monsters and we love our monsters. Um, oops, went too far, too far. We love our monsters and we love as, as much variety as possible. Uh, this right here is the Snallygaster of Maryland. It's an octopus chicken dragon <laughs> that was reported a lot back, back in the uh, night, uh, early 20th century. But again, anything with a unique shape, a story around it, some kind, at least one eyewitness, maybe a newspaper account, we'll put it right in there. Um, and I don't know what it is about us. We love to collect monsters. I mean, the reason why we put a pantheon of Universal Studios monsters together, you know, we put um, Pokemon, right? That taught entire generations to collect them all. We just like monsters and variety of monsters. And in my book, uh, in the United States of Cryptids, we have over 70 di different creatures uh, in that. And just to show you the wide variety of monsters um, that exist out there, or right? exist out there in the stories. Now, the next thing I want to tell you is what I learned to be the strangest things about cryptids, you know, in a world of, of snally gasters, right? The strangest things I learned about cryptids um, is this, that there are towns that theme their entire world around these monsters. Um, in fact, that's kind of the angle of the United States of cryptids. So I kind of explained the cryptids part, but the United States part, besides the fact that we have creatures from all 50 states in the book, is that we really focused on those towns that celebrated their monsters. So what I kind of do in the book is I guarantee this, I, I claim it that's the only cryptid book that guarantees a sighting. I I'll guarantee you a sighting of a cryptid if you read this book, because it takes you to all the places they're celebrating these creatures. And what do I mean by celebrating these creatures? So in the book, I talk about at least 40 cryptid statues across the US. Bronze, wood, major civic statues in town squares, not just like collectible mass market statues on shelves. I'm talking major civic events like this one. This is the Gloucester Sea Serpent in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, it's right outside the Historical Society, exactly where you think they put a, a bronze pilgrim or something colonial there. No, they put the Gloucester Sea Serpent, which is probably the most documented cryptid in the, in the entire canon of cryptids. It was seen for like two years off the coast of Cape Ann, which is where Gloucester is, and everybody saw it. There were ship captains saw it, and scientists saw it, and townsfolk saw it, and it was just always there, and there's tons of documentation, tons of of speculation about this creature. And now it has a bronze statue right downtown. That's one way these towns have really celebrated, celebrated their, their monsters. Second way is, uh, I talk about at least 18 cryptid museums uh, across the country. 
Um, this one is the Monster Mart. This is dedicated to a Bigfoot creature called the Folk Monster, also the, the monster of Boggy Creek. This was a Bigfoot creature from the 1970s in Folk, Arkansas, that um, basic Bigfoot story, although in this case, it's one of the few cryptids ever try to attack a human being. Most cryptids just disappear in the night. This one, the story is it actually reached into a house and tried to swipe at a person who was sleeping there on the couch. But that was 1971. About a year later, a movie was made about um, the folk monster called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And it was kind of fake documentary, it used locals as actors, and it became kind of um, famous, a cult, cult movie among horror, the horror movie genre fans. And that kind of elevated the folk monster above other Bigfoot across the country. And the Monster Mart is really cool. It's right in Folk, Arkansas. You go in there, there's a convenience store part of it, because it is a mart. <laughs> there's a gift store part of it. And then there's a museum part of it with full-size Bigfoot. And it's a really, really, really cool spot. Well worth, well worth, well worth seeing if you're ever in Folk, which you have to want to go to Folk to get to Folk. You're not going to pass through it. It's very, very an obscure place. Um, but that's it. And th these numbers are probably even out of date right now, even though this, this is fresh off this book. I feel like I hear about a new museum every single week that features, that, that focuses on cryptids. The third way that towns really grab onto their local monsters and celebrate them is by literally celebrating them. There's at least 24 cryptid festivals. This is another number that keeps going up and down, especially post COVID where a lot of festivals had to shut down for a year or two, but they literally every year have a party. They bring in tourists and they celebrate like the town of Churubusco, Indiana, which does turtle days every June, which I know what you're saying, you know, we have turtle bodies. We, we, <laughs> turtles are real creatures, they're in zoology. In this case, they're celebrating a very specific turtle, a, <laughs> a turtle the size of a living room or dining room table, a gigantic turtle found in a pond outside of town in, in Churubusco that they went on to name the Beast of Busco. So this turtle days is really focused on this one creature that for a year, or at least a, a season, really just captured the imaginations of the people of Churubusco, made national headlines, they dredged that pond, they sent divers down that pond, they sent female sea turtles down that pond trying to tempt the Beast of Busco out. Um, the farmer that owned the property almost went bankrupt trying to find this turtle instead of farming his land. It was a very, very, very exciting event in the town of Churubusco, and they celebrate it every year now. Um, and the reason why I love this, oh, and also if you go to Churubusco, you don't have to hit it right in the festival to see giant turtles. They have statues everywhere. There's local businesses themed. There's like a dentist whose symbol is a turtle shaped like a tooth or a tooth shaped like a turtle. One of the two things, a chocolatier with it. The water tower has a big turtle on it. So they really, really, really accept this as an identity. And I love this. This is really the reason I got, I love cryptids and monsters, but really this is what got me into this book that you could actually go out there and, and physically interact with these towns that are celebrating monsters. Most towns and cities, the only way they have an identity is through their local sports team, right? So if you see, I'm up here in New England, if you see somebody walking around with a Bruins cap, you're like, ah, oh, okay, that person's probably New England or has a connection to New England. So sports teams form an identity. And I, I'm, I, I'm kind of bored by that. The other way we try to form identities with towns is either through some generic historic event, usually a war or something, or our natural features, right? We tout our lakes, we tout our coastline, we tout our mountains, we tout our fields, we tout our farms. And honestly, Every, every state has those. It's not a very big differentiator, you know, um, most of the time. But if you have a turtle the size of a dining room table in your history, that's yours. Only you have that. You should run with that because you're the only town on the planet that's going to be able to say home of the Beast of Busco. So I love this. This makes me so happy that, that towns can have this like, kind of unique identity. Um, the third thing I learned, there's like, in the world of cryptozoology, there is a kind of an elephant in the room. And this elephant is giant and bipedal and very hairy and his name is bigfoot bigfoot is huge like i said if you don't know what a cryptid is you definitely know what bigfoot is and he's massive he's the face of cryptozoology he's the face of way more than that he's the face of movies and tv shows and products we all are very familiar with a very specific beef jerky brand all because they nabbed sasquatch as their spokesperson spoke beast he's huge and he was a thorn in my side this entire book. I was so mad at this one particular crypt of the entire book because I wanted I wanted a book full of variety. I, like I said, over 70 monsters. I wanted the towns to celebrate very unique things like Snallygasters, like the Beast of Busco. And everywhere I went, they were celebrating Bigfoot. Everywhere I went. When I said there's 40 statues of cryptids across the country, I would say 20 to 25 of them are of Bigfoot. Uh, here's a good example. Um, the concrete one on in the upper corner, that's in Washington State. That's the largest Bigfoot statue out there. It's 30 some feet made of concrete. Side that is a more mass marketed statue, but it's in uh, Virginia. Side that is the South Dakota Bigfoot. Uh, that's the largest chainsaw Bigfoot on the planet. It's right there, almost in the shadow of Mount Rushmore. 
Uh, but if you measured it from tip of its big toe to top of its kind of pointy head, it's actually the biggest statue. Below that is California, beside that's North Carolina, and then there's Gasquatch. So in a book where I learned terms like Snallygaster and Snarly Yow, my favorite term is Gasquatch. So Gasquatch, this is a, this would be the largest Bigfoot statue in the country if it weren't for the fact that it's a sign, it's two-dimensional. Gasquatch is what it is, sounds like. It's a gas station themed around Sasquatch. You know, you go there, you can gas up, you can buy convenience store stuff, you know, beef jerky with, you know, Bigfoot on it and other stuff. You, there's obviously there's um, tons of merchandise. You can buy a Gasquatch t-shirt and stuffed Gasquatches. And then they have this giant, this giant um, cage that descended from the ceiling. It's supposed to be a Bigfoot cage. And then there, there's a reward posted for anybody that finds Bigfoot and can put him in the cage. It is a blast. And all, all you're there to do is get gas and it, you, you're in the shadow of Gasquatch. And again, I think that thing is 32 feet tall is the size of that statue. So pretty, pretty tall. So everybody loves Bigfoot. And Everybody has seen Bigfoot. Bigfoot has been seen in all 50 states, even Hawaii, even Rhode Island, even Delaware, those tiny states um, and island states. They've all seen Bigfoot. So again, it's almost as undifferentiated as a lake. <laughs> every town has a lake. Every town has a Bigfoot. So again, I kept trying to find unique monsters and having to fight off the Bigfoot <laughs> to, to get to them. My favorite example of this is these, this, this creature. This is the green monster or the Flatwoods monster or the Braxton County monster. See, the way cryptids get named is usually um, within the first few sightings or first few newspaper reports, some, you know, some clever journalist or clever investigator comes up with a, with a cool name. For some reason, in this case, they never did that. So we never arrived at one unified name for this creature. We just call it whatever you want to call it, Flatwoods monster, green monster, Braxton County monster. They're all the same pointy-headed creature. And this thing, this thing comes from an event that happened in uh, Flatwoods, West Virginia, and also Sullivan ne right next door, where a bunch of kids were out in the 1950s, a light streaked across the sky, seemed to hit a nearby hill. So they all went and got their mom and they all tromped up this hill to see what had happened. And they ran into a 10 foot tall, smelly creature with glowing eyes uh, that one witness described as Frankenstein with B.O. They all got scared, they ran away, came back the next day and all that was left was some weird slime on the ground. But so this is our other <laughs> this is our other robot alien cryptid, uh, the Flatwoods monster. Uh, all the witnesses describe it as robotic, the way it floated, the way it moved. Uh, it came from the sky. That's what the, the trail of light was. So it's another you know robot mon robot cryptid, but it's very unique. Nobody in the country has a Flatwoods monster like of this design. <laughs> Nobody has this, and they've done a really great job of capitalizing on that. So they have a, a, a museum downtown, right on right on the main street, that has you know artifacts and tchotchkes to sell. Um, life-size Flatwoods monsters. They have these chairs that I'm sitting in here up in the corner all over the place, like in various points, various points of the town. They have the requisite signage that, that should be there. The spot there is a photo op right in front of a restaurant called The Spot. So they've kind of jumped on the bandwagon as well. And everywhere you go, you see these ceramic lanterns being sold. I have one myself. Uh, first, one, first time I saw one, I wasn't even in like monster mode yet. I was just driving to Flatwoods, stopped to get gas at a convenience store. And there was just an entire shelf full of these ceramic Flatwoods monsters. And what you do is you put a light inside of them or a flame and they glow just like the Frankenstein B.O. did. So a great creature, great story, very unique moment in their history. They've capitalized on it. And then last year, just a block away from the Flatwoods County Monster Museum, they, somebody opened the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum. Because um, again, we all love Bigfoot, but again, we all have Bigfoot. So you don't need to go to West Virginia to see probably even a Bigfoot museum. There's probably one closer to you than, <laughs> than that even. Um, but again, there's this, this phenomenon that Bigfoot is everywhere and gigantic. And this really bothered me. I, I, had, I had to like really deal with this. I mean, I, had, I, I wanted all kinds of monsters and I got it. I, you have to dig deep and you can find all kinds of monsters across the country. But again, you have to go through big, smelly, hairy hides to do it. So I went to the went to an expert to talk to him about this topic. And that expert was Lauren Coleman. Lauren Coleman has been the face of cryptozoology for decades. He's pretty much the guy that popularized it uh, for us. If there's a documentary about cryptozoology, he's one of the talking heads. Uh, he was one of the investigators in some of the original cases. Uh, the, the Dover Demon, uh, he named it. He's one of the first investigated it. He was from Illinois. There's a bunch of original Illinois creatures that he investigated. Um, he opened the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine, which is still running. He still, he still runs it, as well as a satellite um, library in Bangor, Maine. Um, so he knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. And he told me, he said, hey, when people come to the museum, I always ask them, what's your favorite cryptid? And they almost always say Bigfoot. And he told me when he was a kid, 
the most famous cryptids, even though I don't think cryptid was a term back then, the most famous cryptids were uh, the Yeti, the abominable snowman, way out in the Himalayas, in Tibet, and um, the Loch Ness Monster. So two very exotic creatures, very far away from us, across the ocean, across the world. Those are the two famous creatures. And then in the late 1950s, when um, a bunch of workmen found tracks around the worksite in Northern California, a clever journalist jumped on that and called it Bigfoot. And suddenly Bigfoot was all the rage. So I asked him, I was like, oh, so is that the reason Bigfoot's so big? Is it because he's A, biologically plausible, and B, he's everywhere? Like we can just jump into a forest and, and chase him? Is that why? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, Good. those are, ideas are probably valid. There's probably, those are fringe reasons. But the real reason that we all love Bigfoot is <laughs> because we're narcissists. He said that we see ourselves in Bigfoot. It's a bipedal mammal with fur and hair, expressive face. So we love it. So we really love Bigfoot because, it, and that's the source of all bias and prejudice and racism and all that stuff is we tend to only want to be, or we, we tend to be drawn by stuff that looks like us, right? Uh, very specifically like us. So basically at the end of the day, we like Bigfoot because we're cryptid racists. So that is a very interesting, very interesting phenomenon, I think. I think he nailed it on the head with the narcissism. Because I thought about that more, and uh, he had very astute, you know, research level reasons for saying this. I am less a student researcher and research driven, uh, but I think he's right. And my proof for that is the 1980s movie is called Harry and the Hendersons. <laughs> it's a family, fun, family friendly, very funny movie. Jonathan Lithgow, a family hits, hits Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest and takes him home. Of course they do, right? He's cuddly. He's funny. He's a little bit clumsy and get a little scary, but they love him, right? Um, and he's, he's great, right? You can never have, and here's my proof, right? Uh, you can never have this movie with the lizard man of Skateboard Swamp in South Carolina. You can never have the lizard man and the Hendersons. It would be a totally different movie. It, it's not cuddly. It's not anything like that. It would be a, to, it'd be a horror movie. You couldn't have a comedy around that. You also couldn't have the infield horror and the Hendersons, it, it, which is a monster out of Illinois. Illinois just doesn't work. Only Harry and the Hendersons works because basically we all want Bigfoot to be our friend. That's why he's the most popular cryptid. That's why we're always chasing after him in the forest and, and knocking on wood with wood to kind of draw him out. That's why we're planting beef jerky to draw him out of the shadows. It's because he wanted to be our friend. Um, and it, which is really, again, narcissism because we see ourselves in Bigfoot. So that was my, my, my life with Bigfoot. <laughs> it's really just trying to avoid using him in the book as much as I could. And the few times I use Bigfoot is very specifically, and I'll show you one here in a little bit that's related to New York. So, okay, if... Bigfoot is the most boring of all the uh, creatures. What state should I go to to see cool creatures? So I've got two, I got two, um, two options for you. Some, and some states do have better cryptids than others, which is what I learned. Some states I had to try really, really hard to find cryptids in their neighborhood that were unique and interesting. Um, like my state of New Hampshire. I had to try really hard to find good cryptids in New Hampshire. Um, but the best state I think is probably Wisconsin. Not only do they have the most variety, they celebrate their monsters really well. So Wisconsin, of course, has Bigfoot and it has lake monsters. Every state has those, but it has the Hodag. The Hodag is the uh, favorite son of Rylander, Wisconsin. They have a giant statue, which is pictured here in front of their Chamber of Commerce. They sell um, merchandise in all the shops for the Hodag. They have Hodag days every, every week. It is, they, are, they love Hodag. If you go to rylander.gov, if you go to their actual, their, their town website, they don't tell you about the town history or the town geography or the town. They tell you about the Hodag. There are Hodag video games or Hodag clubs to join. They love their Hodag. And the Hodag is basically, it's like a panther-sized, very thorny looking creature. And it comes from the lumberjack tales. So back in the 19th century, when lumberjacks would go out to fell wood, you know, at nights would get kind of creepy. And they'd sit around the campfire or sleep in the tents. And they would hear stuff and they would see stuff. And they would kind of give it each different noise and each different idea, its own personality. And the Hodag is one of the animals that the lumberjacks came up with as they were sitting on the fire telling each other tales. Below that, the Mount Horeb trolls. Mount Horeb loves trolls. They don't believe in trolls, but they love them. So they have a main street that's covered with wooden statues of trolls from three feet tall to 10 feet tall. And they call it the troll way. And it's just, a, it's, they've taken over the town. They are known for their trolls. They're known for, for their trolls more than anything else they have. Across from that, the Beast of Bray Road. This is a werewolf type creature found in, in Wisconsin, in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, back in the late 70s and 80s. And, you know, people love it. This house is on Bray Road and they love it so much they erected a beast in their own front yard so people will have photo ops. And then the Rhinolapis is a very interesting creature. I don't have time to dig into his story, but he doesn't have a story. This is a meta cryptid. It's, it's actually the next town over from, from Rhinelander. It's Monaco, Wisconsin. And this is just a bundle of roots that somebody found in the swamp, pulled out about 
100 years ago, 70 years ago, something like that, put it in front of their shop, painted it, put it in their front of the shop and called it rhinolapis because it looked like a rhinoceros, elephant, octopus. So they put all, the, pull that, put all that together. And these days they've kept it. They've kept it. It's in the town park. They love it. They talk about how it preys on hodags because it's a little bit of a rivalry with um, Rhinelander next door. And it's kind of like they have their, they made up their own monster story. They didn't need some kind of like <laughs> incident in their past to have it. They just, they just made one. And that's how kind of cool it is. And, and they celebrate it. So Wisconsin's a good one. Uh, West Virginia is a really good one. Uh, we talked about the Flatwoods monster already. We're going to talk about the Mothman. We'll get to him. Vegetable Man, he's a, a sentient plant, which we don't really have enough of in our stories, I think. And then the Grafton monster. So, and again, it has Bigfoot. It has lake monsters. Every town does. But West Virginia is a very good state for uh, strange creatures. And, and now hopefully I've kind of redefined their state motto of wild, wonderful for you. Next, um, what else? I, the other thing I discovered in the world of cryptids is that Hollywood might have something to do with it or some of our cryptids. And this is, these are fascinating. This is probably my favorite section of the, of the presentation, honestly, because these are some fascinating stories. Um, Hollywood's relationship with cryptids. For instance, this is the Wolf Woman of Mobile, Alabama. The one on the right is, uh, is the, the rust colored one is a drawing for, for my book done by Derek Quinlan, who I said did, did all the illustrations for it. The opposite one is the original drawing when the newspapers first reported about the spotting of the Wolf Woman in Mobile, Alabama. So again, if there's a, if a if an eyewitness or a journalist jumps on the drawing, that becomes a kind of our form for its entire life of the story. And there's not much of a story. Just a report started coming in one night in 1971 of a wolf with a woman's face and it was multiple reports some of them were jokes because you know it's very funny to have a you know <laughs> a, a wolf with a beautiful face a uh, beautiful human face running around some of them were scared some of them were real calls in and then it eventually just disappeared it's a very weird story it just so happens that same year a movie by the name of mephisto waltz came out this is a movie starring alan alda it's about satanic possession basically very weird very trippy very spooky movie now it wasn't out at the time that the wolf woman was sighted However, the trailer for the movie was out um, in theaters, on TV. So a lot of people saw the trailer. And in that trailer, which again is spooky and surreal, a, there's a three second scene where a well-dressed woman walks through the party with a human headed dog on a leash. It's a three second, very weird scene. <laughs> there's really no context for it. So the idea may be that it influenced somebody and in seeing they saw something rustle in the bushes and that kind of influenced them. Or it could have been a hoax or it could have no connection whatsoever. But it's very interesting that Hollywood had a face, a uh, human-headed dog in their, in their advertising, and then Mobile Alabama started seeing uh, a human-faced wolf. And if that was the only story I had for you, it would be kind of a, a very sheer connection, not, not very interesting. But I have other connections for you. And, and while the, Mo, the Wolf Woman of Mobile Alabama is a very obscure one, let's talk about a very famous one, Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, right? So the Loch Ness Monster is, I know, out of my jurisdiction. It's not in the United States of cryptids, but it's you know another iconic cryptid. And the first sighting of Nessie as, as in his current form as a long neck reptilian creature was in 1933 uh, by a pair who were on vacation driving around the, the lock. Um, that same year in the US and the UK, King Kong premiered. One of the, one of the most influential movies of all time, had people gasping. It was, it was an amazing, amazing feat, even, even now, honestly, looking back on it, but showed people things they had never seen before, not just on our movie screen, but at all. And that included a scene of a brontosaurian creature swimming around attacking people. It's a very, very, very intense scene, honestly, from the earlier scenes during Skull Island before King Kong was taken to New York City. However, the first sighting of Nessie wasn't in the water. The first sighting of Nessie was just crossing the road, walking across dry land as a brontosaurian creature, which also happened in the movie. Almost scene by scene happened in the movie of a brontosaurian creature walking across a road on dry land. So some people say that we have the Loch Ness Monster because of King Kong. So I've given you two kind of cocktail party bon mots. <laughs> One is without King Kong, we wouldn't have the Loch Ness Monster. And the second is um, that because the, we're all, the Bigfoot is so big because we're all narcissists. That, those are two little facts you can take away from this and I'll be happy. Um, another one I'll give you is one of these is the Chupacabra. The other one is uh, an alien monster from a movie called Species. Now the Chupacabra, as famous as the Chupacabra is, and it's very, very famous. It's a relative newcomer. The golden age of cryptids was, uh, at least sighting cryptids, was the 1950 through 1979. So three decades were the, were the golden age of cryptids. Chupacabra came on the scene in 1995. Uh, it was first seen in Puerto Rico. It's since then, been, you know, sightings have spread to Mexico and the Southwest United States. But Puerto Rico is where this whole thing uh, originated. And the first sightings of, the first evidence of Chupacabra were a bunch of exsanguinated livestock, 
you know, li livestock who had been drained of all blood, dead in the fields. The first sighting of a creature being responsible for that was described as an alien looking creature with, spi with spiky back. Certain, research, certain researchers pressed forward and talked to the eyewitness and she admitted to us having seen a week earlier, a movie called Species about an alien creature with spikes down its back. So again, very interesting connection that could have nothing to do with each other or could have everything to do with each other. Now I have one more example um, that's not skeptical. Like the book isn't skeptical, I'm not skeptical. It's not, it's not my thing, I just, I love the connection. But there's a much more interesting connection between Hollywood and cryptids and it involves this creature, the coelacanth. Coelacanth was a, is a fish, giant fish with limbs that, with fins that look like limbs. It looks like it's a missing link. Like it's halfway between thinking about getting out of the water and walking around. Um, it was thought extinct in human history. Like we thought it was extinct tens of millions of years ago, um, that it wasn't around anymore until 1938 when uh, Courtney Latimer found it at a fish market where it had been pulled out of the water off of South Africa, I believe. So this is actually a cryptid story. So cryptids aren't just animals that have never been, never been discovered. They're also creatures that we think are gone. Um, that's still around. So this is a kind of a cryptid success story where, you know, we didn't think coelacanths existed, hadn't existed for tens of millions of years. That's how confident we were. And then boom, 1938, we're like, oh, wait, they're still around. And oh, wait, here's more and here's more and here's more. And once we found one, we found a bunch more. So this is uh, kind of a, a cryptid success story. Uh, so successful, in fact, that the, inter the uh, International Cryptozoology Museum, instead of Bigfoot, instead of the Loch Ness Monster for its logo, it uses the coelacanth. Um, this is also what I, what I call the cryptozoologist curse, because the second a cryptid is found, it leaves cryptozoology, <laughs> it goes over to zoology. So if we found Bigfoot tomorrow, he would no longer be a cryptid. He would over, be over here in zoology, maybe even anthropology, depending on what you think about Bigfoot. So it's very sad to be a crypt cryptozoologist sometimes, because the second you find your biggest success, it's ripped out of your hands and given to other scientists. So um, that happened. The coelacanth, in this case, instead of Hollywood influencing maybe what we saw as monsters, this coelacanth inspired Hollywood. It would go on, um, it was called in the papers a living fossil. And this kind of phrase was very evocative to a pair of screenwriters who would say, that's a cool idea. That's, this, this creature lived for millions of years in water and we just didn't know, we didn't know it was there. And they came up with the idea based on the coelacanth of the creature from the Black Lagoon in 1955. Uh, Harry Essex and Arthur Ross were the two screenwriters who, who came up with this guy. And he became, you know, one of the most famous, not just cinema monsters, but cinema creations of all time, the, the creature from the Black Lagoon, all because we dredged this cryptid out of the water, which is, I think, a, is a beautiful story. And then it continues because the cryptid, creature from the Black Lagoon, I oh, can't say it, creature from the, the creature from the, the Gill Man, he came out in 1955, around the time that the Loveland Frogman was first discovered. Now, the Loveland Frogman uh, is a story out of Loveland, Ohio, bipedal, amphibious creature, uh, that was seen hanging around a bridge one night in the mid 1950s. So the idea might be that the coelacanth inspired the creature from the Black Lagoon, which then inspired its own cryptid, the Loveland Frogman. Although I will say one of the details in the Loveland Frogman case is that they might have been these these amphibious creatures might have been holding metal looking wands that sparked at the end. So they might have been aliens. They might not have been just missing links. They might have been aliens, or I guess they could have been wizards. <laughs> Those could have been magic wands. But they were possibly directly inspired by the creature from the Black Lagoon. All right, I have one more Hollywood story to tell you. It has nothing to do with who influenced who. It has, to, it has probably the most interesting cryptid story I heard. Um, if there is a Hall of Fame for cryptozoology, a surprise entrance into it would be this man, Jimmy Stewart, right? Pleasant faced, good guy actor, Jimmy Stewart, who never did a horror movie in his life, I don't think. He did a couple of Alfred Hitchcock thrillers. The closest he got to a creature feature was probably Harvey, which is about a six foot tall invisible rabbit that he only saw when he was drunk and he was drunk the whole movie. Um, but he never did have a creature feature. He's not a, he's not a, like a horror icon like Christopher Lee or um, Peter Cushing, right? He's just Jimmy Stewart. He's, it's a wonderful life guy. Um, but he's involved in one of the most interesting cryptid papers out there involving this stuff, which is a supposed Yeti scalp and Yeti hand. So not Bigfoot, Yeti, over there in Tibet. These are artifacts found in the Pangbosh Monastery in Tibet. Um, once upon a time, when you wanted to find cryptids, you couldn't just go into the local forest and bang on wood or plant beef jerky. You had to get an expedition, cross the ocean. You had to get some kind of rich guy to fund your expedition to the Himalayas, to Mount Everest, to find Bigfoot. And that's exactly what happened. Um, Edmund Hillary, the guy that topped Everest, went on a few crypt, uh, Yeti expeditions funded by people. In this case, a very rich businessman by the name of Tom Slick 
uh, wanted to know if that Yeti hand was real. He wanted to know it. So he wanted a sample to bring back to a scientist in the UK to test it. Um, so he sent an expedition over there. They got a piece of the hand, whether they stole it, replaced it with a human finger bone, or just uh, bartered for it. We don't know, which probably means they stole it. Um, and then they had to get it to the UK. Getting it from Tibet to India was no problem. The border was porous. They just stuck in a backpack and crossed it. No problem. Problem was getting from India to the UK meant boat, plane, and meant security. And if you got caught <laughs> with a human looking finger in your bags, problems, right? If you get arrested, that's gonna get confiscated at the very least. There'd be a lot of questions and it would be an international issue, right? So they, they told Tom Slick, we got it, but we don't know how to get it back to the UK. And Slick said, well, here, I got a friend in Calcutta who might help us. Now, Tom Slick being a wealthy businessman, he was an oil magnate, had a lot of art, artist friends because rich people like to hang around artists, musicians and actors and have those people in their, in their stable of friends. And it just so happened, Tom Slick knew Jimmy Stewart. They were business partners in various ventures. And he said, listen, Jimmy Stewart is vacationing in Calcutta with his wife. Let's see if he'll take the, if he'll take the bone across, across the uh, borders to, to the UK. So he, he contacted uh, Jimmy Stewart and said, hey, can you meet a friend of mine in the lobby, in the lobby of your hotel and do a favor for me? <laughs> Jimmy's like, yeah, sure. I'm sure he's a good guy. In real, he was a good guy in real life. He's like, yeah, sure. So they met in the lobby of the Grand Hotel. And this, this emissary of Tom Slick explained the caper. He's like, I need you to take this mummified finger across the border so you can get tested by a UK scientist. And Jimmy's like, okay, sure. Because nobody searches the bags of Jimmy Stewart. He's an international movie star. You don't, he's not a terrorist. He doesn't have nefarious <laughs> intentions. He's a movie star. So he wouldn't get searched. But just to be safe, they stuck that finger bone in his wife's lingerie case. Because you're not going to search Jimmy Stewart. You're definitely not going to search his wife's stuff. And you're certainly not going to search her unmentionables at all. So they stuck this Yeti finger in her underwear case. And it worked. The caper worked. They went across with no problems. It got in the hands of the UK scientist. And he tested it. And it came up inconclusive. <laughs> Didn't know if it's a Yeti or human finger. Then the finger disappeared. Disappeared for years and years and years until after the scientist's death, where they found it in a box of his belongings. So it was about 2008 when they found it, 2007, 2008. So they tested it, and it turned out to be in just an ordinary human finger, unfortunately. Except <laughs> that it's no longer just an ordinary human finger. It's the human finger that Jimmy Stewart crossed borders with and smuggled in his wife's underwear case. So it almost made it cooler than a Yeti finger, in my opinion. Um, so that's it. That's a really cool, and, and this story has been researched in the International Muse Cryptozoology Museum. They actually have a letter from Jimmy Stewart acknowledging the fact that, yes, I did smuggle a Yeti finger <laughs> across the border from Calcutta to, uh, to uh, London, to England. So, all right, that's Hollywood. I will leave Hollywood now and tell you the, original, the question that first got shot at us right away, what is my favorite cryptid? And I'll tell you why. So my favorite cryptid is the Mothman, hands down the Mothman. I call it the Wendy's of cryptids, right? Because Bigfoot's McDonald's, Billion Serves, L Loch Ness Monster, or other lake monsters are, are Burger King. So third place, if that's Wendy's or Chick-fil-A, I don't know, is the Mothman. Four reasons why I love the Mothman. First, it's just a look cool looking creature. It's a moth human, like that's awesome. It's called the Mothman because again, a quick-witted journalist named it really fast and it stuck. Um, the story there is that Batman was very popular there. It was 1966 was when the first sighting of the Mothman was. The Burt Ward, Adam West movie or TV series was all the rage. So it's pretty easy for him to get from Batman to Mothman. And so it's just a cool creature. The other thing I like about the Mothman it is, is that it is a complete arc of a story. Most cryptid stories are teenagers in a car in the back roads at night. They see something with glowing eyes that chases them. They go back, tell somebody, chaos ensues, hunting parties ensues, parties ensue, marketing ensues. And then the creature gets away after days or months or weeks or a year, however long it takes for, for that flap to end. And it just disappears. For the Mothman, the story ends with a tragedy. Uh, it ends with the uh, collapse of the Silver Bridge, which spans the Ohio River from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, home of the Mothman, to Ohio. Um, it was December of 1967, almost, a, almost exactly a year after the first sighting of the Mothman, which was sighted variously throughout that year. Um, there was a faulty I-beam on this bridge. It was full capacity. There was, there was all these basically Christmas shoppers just lining this bridge. The I-beam I cracked, broke. Everybody plunged in the icy Ohio and 46 people died. And after that, people stopped talking about the Mothman. Um, of course, the obvious explanation for that is they had bigger issues on their minds than <laughs> a humanoid moth flying around the town. Um, other people say that that's, that tells us that this creature was a, more of a harbinger than anything else, that it was trying to warn us of this imminent disaster a year away in which case it sucked at that, right? It didn't, it didn't help us solve, fix that tragedy or um, avert that tragedy. But 
that's the story. Any story that starts with the Mothman being sighted in the back, because again, he has the same story as the rest, backwoods, teenagers, red eyes, chases. It ends. It has, it has a nice arc. So anybody that starts that story will end at the Silver Bridge um, tragedy. So it has a nice arc of a story. Or not a nice arc, but an actual arc of a story. It has an ending. Third reason why I like the Mothman is that Point Pleasant has really capitalized on it. This is my family at the Mothman statue, which is this gleaming stainless steel creature right in the middle of town, not hidden behind a gift shop, not in some far off embarrassed park, right in the middle of downtown, right beside the Mothman Museum, which is also an awesome place. They also are host to the Mothman Festival every September where this town of 4,000 people is inundated by 10,000 people, basically triples in size for that one week in September, and is the most successful piece of their economy. And this is great. Again, I would never have been to Point Pleasant. I've been to Point Pleasant multiple times, and every single time is because of the Mothman. And I would never have gone if the Mothman wasn't celebrated in this fashion. So it works. Uh, in fact, the, if you remember, I mentioned 24 festivals, uh, cryptid festivals across the country. I would say half of them were directly inspired by the success of the Mothman Festival. Um, they saw what happened to that town, and they wanted to um, replicate that with their own monsters. So those are three reasons, the creature, the story, the celebration. But the fourth reason is immersion. You can actually go hunt the Mothman. Um, if you try to go find where Bigfoot is sighted, it's usually just you know, anonymous forest, a stretch of road. It's nowhere interesting <laughs> where cryptids pop up. But the Mothman was seen mostly around what's called the TNT area. The TNT area was this wild area outside of town uh, pocked by these giant cement igloos, giant house-sized igloos that were built in World War II to house munitions, explosives. Um, when World War II ended, the bombs in Japan, the silos were emptied out, and then some, some of them were filled with chemical waste. <laughs> some some, some uh, companies leased them and filled them with chemical waste, which some say is the origin of the Mothman. Um, but you can go today and go investigate them. I took my daughter one night, really after dark, um, spooky as all get out, and <laughs> wandered around these graffiti-ridden, trash-strewn, um, giant silos that are in the wild so they're still like overgrown in the wild it's a park now an accessible very accessible honestly or most of these are accessible but still you can feel like you're actually hunting for the mothman i joked when i was writing the book that when i was hunting cryptids but by hunting cryptids i meant i was going to the local bar and drinking whatever craft beer they had that was themed after a cryptid because for some reason every local bar every local brew or local brewery has a beer that's themed after a crypt after its local cryptid i have a bunch on the shelf behind me actually but in this case, you can literally go see the lair of the Mothman. So that's why I love the story. All those four elements are just beautiful to me. Um, and he's my favorite cryptid. He hasn't been surpassed. Out of the hundred, more than 100 that I researched, the more than 70 that are in the book, uh, he's my favorite. All right, I'm going to bust this real fast. I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, but obviously, this is a New York-sponsored event, a New York Library-sponsored event. So I want to talk about some New York cryptids. So you guys got three in the book. That's how you're not the biggest state in the union, obviously. But you guys got three out of a, uh, 50 states and 70, 70 uh, monsters, you got a good bit of them. Uh, granted, the ones you got are lake monsters and Bigfoot, but you guys have very unique ones. Um, first off, you guys have the Whitehall Bigfoot. Now the story here is not that unique. Bunch of teenagers, backwoods, glowing eyes. In this case, the twist is when they went back to get the authorities, the authorities saw Bigfoot too. So the, uh, there's actual policemen on the record saying, yeah, we saw it. <laughs> uh, and it's on Adair Road, which is where I'm standing there. But the reason I have uh, the Whitehall Bigfoot in the book isn't because of the story, because it's a typical Bigfoot story with that one twist. It's because these days, you can definitely see a Bigfoot in Whitehall, New York. They have statues everywhere. It's almost like a scavenger hunt uh, on the golf course, in front, of the, <laughs> in front of the liquor store, downtown at the park. It's just an amazing place to see Bigfoot. So I love, again, Whitehall, New York, I probably would never visit in my life, but I've been there multiple times, all because of their Bigfoot statues. Uh, and this is really the why I focused on the places I focused on the book and the places that do stuff like this. Similarly, Port Henry, New York is obsessed with its uh, lake monster called Champ in Lake Champlain. Now, Lake Champlain is a giant lake. It's almost a great lake. It's bordered by Vermont, by New York, and by Canada. Um, and interestingly enough, Port Henry kind of has a little bit of a rivalry with Burlington, Vermont across the water because they both are touting Champ as, the, as they're the home of Champ. So it's like, you can imagine this tug of war with this giant scaly serpent between them trying to figure out who owns Champ. Burlington is a little bit better job because they're a bigger city, they're a college town, they have a minor league team named after Champ, they have, they have a lot of resources, but Port Henry is no slouch. You know, they, they theme businesses around it. They have a sightings board. They do a parade for Champ Day every uh, summer. So they do a good job. And I love this one image at the bottom of Champ with the entire town on its back. Like that's the image. There's one image that like kind of summed up my book. It's that, you know, a, tire, a monster supporting an entire town. The other big New York cryptid that I love is another lake monster. 
the Silver Lake Sea Serpent, even though it's a, <laughs> even though Lake Sea is kind of an oxymoron, it's still the Silver Lake Sea Serpent. Again, typical sea serpent story, sighted a serpentine type monster in the lake. The twist here is that most people think it was proven as a hoax, that a local hotelier actually created the sea serpent and that it, the remains of that sea serpent were found when the hotel burned down. Uh, that story is possibly not real, but that's kind of the idea is that it was proven as a hoax. But the people of Perry, New York do not care that it was a hoax. They celebrate this thing with both hands. There are statues, themed businesses. Um, they put it on their bike racks. They put it in the town seal. There's a sea monster on the town seal. Perry, New York, that's important. Settled in 1807, less important. Monster right in the middle, the most important. Um, so I love Perry for that. Again, I've been to Perry multiple times, all because of this creature. Also because they have a place called, um, um, uh, oh man, Prehistoric World, where they have a bunch of uh, reptiles. You can go like handle and stuff, pretty cool. But again, those are the New York cryptids I put in there because the towns are exemplars at celebrating their monsters. And you should all visit those towns. If you're in New York, please visit those towns. Finally, this is gonna be asked to me as well. Do you believe in cryptids? Um, I believe in cryptids. I believe they're real in various ways. So do I believe they're real as biological entities? Nah. <laughs> I mean, some are definitely more plausible than others, for sure. I mean, we have, the world is 75% water. Who knows what's down there? Bigfoot's plausible. We have massive amounts of forest lands and we have tons of evidence of hairy hominids. So plausible. But that's not as interesting a question to me if I believe in cryptids as entities. It's not that interesting a question. I believe, I believe they're real in other ways. For instance, we've seen how they're real as identities, as town identities. I mean, that makes them very real, almost more real even than actual entities that towns have themed their entire lives and existences around them. That makes them very real. But what I really love about cryptids is even if you don't believe in cryptids, something happened every time there was a cryptid site. Um, 90% of my research for cryptids was newspapers, old newspapers, which isn't always the case when I'm researching books. But in this case, something happened in these towns and it happened for weeks and months and years. Something catalyzed you know, hunting parties and newspaper uh, um, uh, investigations and police investigations and people bringing in um, hunters from outside to try to find cryptids. These are historical events. Whether you believe in cryptids or not, the events around the cryptids are absolutely historical. And that makes them real to me. Like that is such a, an amazing thing to me that there, you can go back to the newspapers and just see accounts of people chasing monsters. And the final way I think cryptids are real are as symbols. Um, I believe they exist as even more as symbols of the natural world than secrets of it. Cryptids are inherently hopeful concepts. So if a person believes in Bigfoot, what they're saying is, I really hope that the, we haven't explored the entire planet, that we've taken all of its secrets away, that we've seen every single animal, that all the big surprises on earth have been unearthed. Like I, that's a sad state of affairs. It's like the last chip in the bag. Like, oh, we got it all and we can't leave the planet. That's very boring. So I believe that the people who believe in these cryptids and I even believe in these as, as hopeful concepts. It's just, it's just hope. It's hope that the world is still a very diverse, interesting place that we haven't just you know, zoned the entire planet for McDonald's franchises. So I love cryptids. I love everything about cryptids. I love the history of them. I love what they represent. I love, and I really love the fact that I can just go to a town and party with a bunch of people celebrating the most improbable creatures on the planet. So that's it. If you want to know more of my ramblings, go to my website, oddthingsivescene.com. It's Otis, it's my, it's my acronym. You can hear about all my books, my nonfiction, my novels. If you don't want to buy anything, that's fine. There's hundreds and hundreds of articles of my trips to various weird stuff across the country and across the world, including my visits to cryptid towns. So that's it. Again, my first time giving that. <laughs> I consider it a test run. Uh, hopefully you got something out of it, though. And I do really appreciate you guys coming. And with that, I will try to stop sharing so that you guys can take over here. That was awesome. Hey. That was absolutely awesome. Oh, great. <laughs> Um, we do have, so a lot of the questions were answered and I did make a poll just because it, it seemed appro uh, appropriate. Yeah, it was such a great program. Somebody says, first of all, I really apologize um, about the chat. I don't know why it was not open, um, but we did try to bring everything, in, um, all the Q&A in so people could see what they were saying. We had a poll, which was um, what your favorite cryptid is. So. Let me see. So, I mean, some people threw in what their favorite cryptid is um, through the chat, but the poll said, hang on a second, 18% um, Mothman, 27% Bigfoot, 14% Lake Monster, 0% Creepy Clowns. I had to put that in there. Technically, are Creepy Clowns really, like, would you consider them a cryptid? I wouldn't, but they are being, so that's funny you say that. Lauren Coleman, that's one of his specialties is investigating creepy clowns. So it, huh. in all, in all, like in all the elements, it basically functions like a cryptid for sure. 
Yeah. You really need to like contact that guy because I want to know what his uh, his research is on that. He's okay. great. He's we have nine percent chupacabra, fourteen percent Jersey Devil, and then we had others. Jen, do you want to read some of the others? And then we have a really good question in the chat. Yes. Um, let me go back. Yeah, on the um, let me see. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pukas came up a lot, I remember, and those were really fabulous. I'm glad that Harvey was brought up. <laughs> um, oh, that's a good, the Golden Age of Cryptids question is a good one. Like, why mm -hmm. did I call it the Golden Age of Cryptids? So most of the cryptids that we know today were cited between, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. That was when most of the news reports came out. And then, of course, there are articles that go farther back, the 19th century even. Um, but a lot of times what would happen is the flap would happen, let's say, in 1965. And then in researching that creature, they would see, oh, there are... There are other there are um, other stories pre pre um, predating this story about some of the creatures like chupacabra right 1995 Puerto Rico but once they kind of once that creature was kind of out in the open they started researching it and found something called I can't remember the town name in Puerto Rico but they called it that town vampire and it was in the 1970s and it had a very similar mo where it um, drained the blood of creatures so really the the the, excite, the the American sightings that really kind of formed the idea around cryptozoology all happened in the 50s 60s and 70s and then Bigfoot is a good example because Bigfoot though didn't really come around to the late 50s that's when he was first named Bigfoot and so the 60s and 70s was an explosion of Bigfoot sightings after that that's really uh that's um really interesting um let's see were there any other questions because there's, um, there's yeah. one from Stacy um which cryptid was the hardest to get information about for the book? And I think that is a good question, like kind of about your research, like where were the, the, the most challenges? Yeah, so there's a few cryptids that I, that I called um, One Night Stands, where they appeared one time, to maybe even one witness, and that witness is the only real source. And that, that would happen, so that happened in New Hampshire, right? So I'm in New Hampshire, I'll, I'll bust on New Hampshire. We have like three cryptids, one's Bigfoot, <laughs> one's, one's a leg monster. And I was like, I can't, I have enough, I, I have like four or five Bigfoot, that's enough, that's too many. Um, so I found um, something called, uh, oh, I just, it, it just left my mind. Um, but it was, it was uh, it, one guy went out, for, went out during Christmas to chop down a Christmas tree. So I call it a Christmas cryptid. And while he was out there, discovered a creature that looked kind of like E.T., wrinkly skin, very squat, Long, long basset ears, which is not ET like, but long basset ears. And he saw it, it screamed at him, he screamed at it, and then it took off. They stared at each other for like a long time, then they screamed and took off. And that was the only sighting of the creature. But that was interesting. And then he, that was interesting enough to me to put in the book because not just was it a unique creature that doesn't appear anywhere else in the country, he would go on to talk to a bunch of actual famous astrophysicists about the creature. So there's a story beyond the actual sighting. So those were the hardest um, when they were only one, they were seen one time. Because it was a lot harder for me to like rationalize putting those in the book because it wasn't again I needed stories right I need I need more than just hey I saw it and then it ran away and that was the end it needed to have some kind of a twist so those kinds of monsters were the hardest for me to research but other than that they're really easy to research like I just had to get a you just have to get like a subscription to newspapers.com and then really just dig just sit there dig and search monsters and search certain creatures um, fortunately the cryptids are a very very internet friendly topic you know that's where people love them they. Artists are drawing versions of them. So it's easy to find um, a wider, wider array of cryptids. It's just digging, digging down and finding the truth of what actually happened around those cryptids is a little bit more um, strenuous. We have a question um, from Roger. Any cryptids abroad that you might pursue? Oh, abroad. Uh, so obviously, so I've, I've traveled um, uh, 14, 15 countries, all 49 lower states. I'm missing Alaska. Um, and yet I've never been to Loch Ness. I, that's, I've, been to, I've even been to Edinburgh and I still have not been to Loch Ness. So it's like a childhood dream. So I discovered uh, cryptids as a child reading like John Keel books. And my mind is like, oh, I can't wait to one day go to Loch Ness. And here I am decades later. And now, now, now uh, you know, I know a lot about cryptids as, as, as a result of just loving them and then writing this book. And I still have not been to Loch Ness. And if I die without going to Loch Ness, that's gonna be my biggest deathbed regret is I never made it to the lock. So I know it's a boring answer because it's a really easy one, but I have to go see that. I can't, like, I, like um, in, the, in the PR for the book, from the publisher, they'll, they'll call me a cryptid expert. And I really cannot take that title until I go to Loch Ness. I have to get there. 
We have a really great comment from Heather. Newspapers are the best. I love reading old newspapers for research. Also, I loved he screamed at it. It screamed at him. Apparently, the cryptids are afraid of humans too. I do not blame them, Heather. Yeah, so that, that's something I discovered as well. And I probably should put that in as a as a point in the in the presentation is that cryptids, nobody, nobody's ever attacked by a cryptid in any of these stories. Very rarely. There's probably two or three, two or three stories of attacks, but normally. It's, it's a matter of them just eluding capture. They're, they're running away from us. Like we're kind of the monsters in the scenario. So very, very rarely, even the most scariest um, creatures out there, very rarely attack. Uh, some, of the, some of the exceptions are that one Bigfoot and folk, the Snallygaster is supposed to have grabbed a man and took it, taken him up to a hillside and eaten his guts out. Um, but the newspaper-based accounts, people hurt themselves, obviously. There's definitely self shots and trips, trip, tripping over stuff and all kinds of stuff like that. But um, Cryptids are rarely dangerous. They just kind of want you to stop chasing them. <laughs> um, let's see, is there anything else? Oh, uh, Roggen wolves were um, mentioned also. Um, Germanic or origin um, Feldgeister. No, that's, that's out of my jurisdiction if it's German. But if it's, if it's, mm -hmm. another, if it's, if it's another wolf man, that's, that's another great one where there's a lot of different kinds of wolf human creatures. I talked about the Beast of Bray Road in Wisconsin, but Michigan has a giant myth around dogmen, which is just another, you know, canine human. And Europe has those. And again, that's in our classic monsters. We kind of put those with vampires and mum <laughs> whatever, living mummies. But there are accounts of humanoid animals or humanoid uh, dogs and, or wolves uh, scampering about the world. Let's see. Oh, um, oh, Heather's reading a book about them, <laughs> right? So cool. Oh, that's that's pretty great. Uh, well, we really, really appreciate this. This was such a great event. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for everybody who came, be it again. Um, if this is your um, NaNoWriMo project, if you're just a fan of cryptids, uh, please come to any of the Syosset Library virtual programs. Everybody is welcome. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah, and uh, Stacy says come back for another program, please. I'm actually like already like well, talk uh, going to talk to Jen about drafting an email be, uh, to you because this was super super fun. Yes, absolutely, and we have lots of cool NaNoWriMo stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, if you're interested in the book, um, obviously it's going to be available. Uh, we do um, have a local bookshop called Theodore's, so if you're local. Uh, Theodore's is great, <laughs> um, but if you're not, please, uh, wherever you get your books, because this is super fun. Um, I just had one more really, really, oh, Laura says, thank you, JW, for the great presentation, really interesting and entertaining. If this was your first go around, I think uh, you set you set the bar pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a fun topic, you know, I love talking monsters every time. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any other incidents of cryptids that have been proven to exist? That's something that I'm really curious about. Yeah, totally. Um, gorillas were once considered cryptids. So obviously, you know, people in Africa knew about gorillas, but the Western world didn't know anything about them. And they would hear stories, you know, whatever, the, the old white haired, white, white, <laughs> white scientists in Europe and their, in their clubs would hear stories of large, furry, black creatures. And they'd be like, those don't exist. That's, that sounds like a fairy tale monster. Until Somebody went back and brought pelts back and skulls back and drawings back and like, look, gorillas exist. The Okapi is another one where it was kind of fabled to exist before it actually existed. Um, there is actually quite a few, like any, and it, it makes sense, right? Because usually the first time a creature is discovered, it, it, somebody else knows about it. Somebody else has seen it. There's rumors of it. Um, the, uh, um, so it's, it's the world at large that needs to accept it, right? For, it, for the scientific community at large. So generally people have seen their local creatures it's just, you know, whatever. The rest of the world has to be like, okay, we, we agree to. Platypuses were kind of cryptids at one point. Yes, they? To, to the point that literally scientists would have taxidermy platypuses in their hands and say, there's no way this is a real, this is a real animal. You guys made this thing out of pieces, didn't you? <laughs> like they couldn't even believe the remains that, that platypuses are so weird. That's a great example of one for sure. I had a question about one too. Like, have you uh, encountered any like, um, like fake cryptids and I'm thinking of stuff like the Fiji mermaid you know one that was like sort of a, sh a sideshow exhibit but that was like proven to be false you know yeah so I talk so Fiji mermaids are great I, I love seeing those things and, and there's a bunch in the cryptozoology, cryptozoology museum as well the one I use in the book is the um, jackalope which is the the rabbit with antlers which you know 
doesn't exist. Like it was, it was literally invented by a pair of hunters and taxidermists. And they, it, it's, it's, that, that history is fully out there, but there's tons of towns that theme themselves around jackalopes. Uh, of course, some of course, the source, there's always been like horned rabbit myths, but generally, and this is the sad part of the story, I don't mean to bring it down for you. Those are, those are um, creatures with a very specific type of cancer where, you know, the bone keeps growing out of their heads. And these are, these were sighted and drawn and thought they were actual creatures back in the early days of, of, of uh, zoology. Um, but these days, the, the cute ones we see that are mounted and put on restaurant walls, those are total fabrications that you know, people don't care. They, we love jackalopes. There's entire, like I said, towns that have statues at every crossing that are jackalopes and themed restaurants that are jackalopes. But that's my favorite. Well, the Fiji mermaid is my favorite. But as far as American ones go, um, the jackalope's a great one. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I just, yeah, somebody, um, ha, we, we had um, just so much, so much praise for this. This was really just super, super fun. Um, yeah, I I just this was great. Thank you so much. I I really would love uh, somebody um uh says um I would love a whole set of these whenever JW is available to present. So much fun from half a world away. Um, we love international guests. It is always so cool to us when we have people who are not local um visiting us. Uh, I'm just trying to think that I had one more question. Oh right, like so I don't know about this but i've heard that um like there's like what are they like phantom um like oh, like phantom kangaroos have you ever heard of that oh totally in fact that infield horror that infield horror that i told you about earlier on some people think that it was kangaroo because it's supposed to have three legs you know which would be two legs and a tail for a kangaroo but american kangaroos are cryptids um they they're called phantom kangaroos they're called american kangaroos because kangaroos aren't are native to australia but every once in a while, people see hopping, crouched things, especially in the Midwest, running around. Of course, they could be escaped zoo animals. Um, they could, which is also, if they escape and thrive as a population, they still are cryptids until they're acknowledged. But they're called, in fact, they're called, um, this is my favorite acronym, out of place species. So oops <laughs> is what they're called when you find like a kangaroo in America. So it's almost like God dropped the, dropped the animal in the wrong place. And it's like, oops, that's kind of the acronym is. But kangaroos, and that's another, especially of Lauren Coleman's, is investigating kangaroos in the, in the American Midwest. Same with big cats, uh, lions uh, in the Midwest, in the American Midwest. Obviously, those are African creatures, but there are rumors of them there. Uh, pretty much most states have like big cat um, um, stories. Yeah, I know upstate New York, there's like wallabies that have like either escaped because people decide they're going to keep a wallaby as a pet or they've just escaped from animal sanctuaries. So uh, that's uh, pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> I will say if you guys want to meet me, I will be in New York. I'll be in Sleepy Hollow, New York um, at the end of October. So I'm giving a couple of presentations at Lynnhurst Mansion. So uh, if you guys want to hang, I'll be there. I love Lindhurst Mansion and I love Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, me too. <laughs> too. Oh, so me too. great. Great cemetery there. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm a big fan of Irving and all that stuff. It's one of my favorite places. Very, yes. very cool. And, you know, because I'm a complete dork, I will once again say that a Dark Shadows movie was filmed there. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can, there's actually a tomb that has like a little picture of uh, Barnabas Collins. Um, I've been there. In the, yeah, I've been there. It's, yeah. it's right by, actually, it's right behind Washington Irving's grave. Like you can like. Totally. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I dragged my husband there and he's like, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go every year, every October we're down there. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, once again, um, thank you so, so, so much. Um, yeah, thank um, you. I, I uh, yeah, uh, we loved this too. And um, come back. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think we're having a, um, if you're um, a writing person, I don't know if, if fan fiction is your thing. We're having a fan fiction writing workshop oh, cool. coming up. Mm -hmm. um and then like a few other work writing workshops and some visiting authors in the fall as well um and uh once again on behalf of syosset library um this was a pleasure uh my name was dustin oh yes you can follow us on twitter for events jen is going to drop the information um in the chat hopefully we can like actually have a chat that works next time <laughs> um yeah turn the syosset library turn the page is the library's podcast um Please uh, listen if you want to hear other interesting things, including we interviewed the archivist from Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. So. Oh, yes, cool. And we post all of our events there, too, so you can keep yeah. track of what we're doing. For sure. Uh, JW Ocker, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Oh, 
I appreciate the invite. This was a blast. And um, enjoy your, your evening or day or wherever you may be. Um, and uh, keep looking for those cryptids. <laughs> yes. Thanks, everybody. Okay, everyone. Good night. Bye.